Good evening. It's my great pleasure this evening to welcome you to the Blatnik School of Government. Government. My name is Todd Hall, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations and Tutor in Politics at St. Anne's College. And it's my honor and pleasure today to be introducing Professor Allison. And I will be moderating the discussion that follows. We also have, as a special treat, the Right Honorable Former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, who, will, who will, we will also be asking for commentary. But when I was first asked to introduce Professor Allison, I must admit it was quite a um, daunting task, I thought, because how do you offer a brief introduction of somebody with a, such a long and illustrious CV? I considered simply saying you were a person who needs no introduction and leaving it that, um, <laughs> as the crowd would seem to indicate. But I will attempt to um, rise to the challenge and say a few words. Professor Allison is a, the rare individual who has not only made contributions within both the academic study of international relations, but also in its actual practice, and has furthermore served as a bridge between the two. His classic, The Essence of Decision, has been a key feature on international relations reading lists for decades. It should probably be subtitled The Essence of International Relations Reading Lists. And long out outlasting its peers and ranking up citations in the thousands. And I anticipate that the work that we're here to speak about today will also rank up citations in the thousands and leave a long legacy. And the concept that is at the center of this work we are gathered to discuss tonight, the Thucydides Trap, has already ranked up some pretty impressive citations, none other than the great political theorist and also sometimes um, in his free time leader of China, Xi Jinping, has, has mentioned it by name, saying there is no such thing as the so-called Thucydides Trap in the world. And so without further ado, I'd like to render the floor to discussion of not only why it exists, but why we should be concerned about it now. Thank you. So thank you very much, and it's a great honor for me to be here. I'm a big fan of the Blavatnik School. I'm a special fan of your dean, whom I've known since she, this was just a dream in her eye and that of the, a number of the other faculty. The first time I've actually seen your new building, which I think is spectacular. And uh, so it's an honor for me to be here. It's also an honor to be back at Oxford since I spent two of my happiest years here in the 1960s as a Marshall Scholar studying philosophy. So I owe a lot to Oxford and feel uh, deeply indebted. So I, the suggestion, Todd suggested I take about 10 or 12 minutes to just give you the elevated version of the argument for the book. Uh, and then uh, I'd be particularly interested in what uh, Prime Minister Rudd has to say or others or questions and arguments. Uh, I'll try to lay it out uh, uh, directly. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, in the next 10 or 12 minutes, first we're going to meet or be reintroduced to a great thinker. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to present a big idea, a really big idea. And third, I'm going to pose a consequential question. So the big thinker is... Thucydides. And I've noticed since the book was published in, uh, uh, the, in May, uh, I've given lots of presentations about the book and noticed, especially in the US, people don't like multisyllabic. And in any case, Thucydides is a mouthful. But if nothing else tonight, you're going to be able to go home and tell your classmate or roommate or friend, I know I met a great thinker. And his name is one, two, three. Thucydides, in unison, one, again, Thucydides, come on, loud, louder. So one, two, three, Thucydides. So I learned how to pronounce the name of Thucydides. That's an achievement. Thucydides was the father and founder of history. He wrote the first ever history book. It's called The History of the Peloponnesian War, about the classic struggle in classical Greece, 5th century BC. So Thucydides should be part of your mental library, and especially for students. And while I hope you'll buy my book and read it, I would say if I had to choose between that and going to the internet and for free downloading book one of the Peloponnesian War, I would do the latter. 
So if you, if you read the 100 pages of book one and every other page doesn't knock your socks off, check your pulse. <laughs> so the big idea, Thucydides trap. So Thucydides trap is the dangerous dynamic that occurs when a rising power like Athens uh, or Germany 120 years ago in the roll up to World War I or China today threatens to displace a ruling power like Sparta, which had been the dominant power in Greece for a century or Britain, which had ruled the waves for a century before Germany challenged it or the US in the current situation after the end of a 20th century that's frequently called the American century. So when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, in general, poop happens. So in the book, I look at the last 500 years, I find 16 cases, one six, in which a rising power threatens to displace a major ruling power 12 of those cases end in war, four of them in not war. So in this famous line that I quote here, it's probably the most quoted line in Western international relations studies, comes from Thucydides. When he says inevitable, he really is, that's hyperbole, exaggeration. He just means very likely. To say that war between the US and China, therefore, in terms of the concept of Thucydides trap is inevitable, would be wrong on its face. Four of the 16 cases was no war. So if you look at my chart, it's got 12 war cases and four no war cases. But to say that the odds are against us would not be an exaggeration. Can we get some sound? Okay, well, in any case, uh, these are people mashing the name Thucydides, which you've learned to, to uh, you, can, you, can, you can get the point. Okay. okay, so the blockbuster movie of uh, 2017 is called uh, uh, Wonder Woman. Some of you have seen it. The plot of it is uh, Wonder Woman is this magical uh, warrior but who's going to bring peace at the end of World War I. She wants to impress this fellow, uh, Ludendorff, who was a historical figure, the military leader of Germany in 1918. And so she comes to this dance, dresses up, uh, usually you see her in the movie as a warrior, uh, and gets, gets his attention. So he's immediately captivated. And she tells him she's come to bring peace. And he says, young lady, peace is only an armistice in an endless war, thinking that he can put her down. And she says, Thucydides. So remember, when you're in a tight spot, what's the name? <laughs> Thucydides. OK, here's Xi Jinping and uh, Barack Obama at their last summit talking about uh, Thucydides' trap. Uh, Xi Jinping, as, uh, as Todd mentioned, has gone from early on saying there's no such thing as Thucydides' trap to now saying the challenge is how to escape Thucydides' trap. And that, I think, basically is correct. So how to escape Thucydides' trap. So I'm going to organize the presentation around uh, three questions, uh, each of which I'll give a tweet-size answer, first uh, in respect of Washington today, and then secondly, I'll say a little bit more. So first question is, what has been the geopolitical event of the last 25 years? The most important geopolitical event of the last 25 years. Second question, what will be the major geostrategic challenge for the next 25 years, as far as anybody can see? And the third question is, can the US and China Escape Thucydides' Trap, the subtitle of the book. So my tweet size answer, the 
geopolitical event of the last 25 years has been the rise of China. Never before has a country risen so far, so fast, on so many different dimensions. Uh, for those of you who haven't been watching, I have a good chapter one called The Rise of China that should give you a jolt. And I quote former Czech President Václav Havel, wonderful line, things have happened so fast we haven't yet had time to be astonished. So second, looking forward, the geostrategic challenge for the next 25 years will be the impact of the rise of China on the US, the US role in the world, and the international order that the US took the lead in constructing and underwriting for the last seven decades. And if I were given just a few more characters, I would say, and not coincidentally, seven decades without great power war. So the impact of the rise of China on the US and the international order. The third question, can America and China escape Thucydides' trap? In the book, I take a professorial sort of uh, no and yes. Okay? <laughs> so no, uh, if we settle for business as usual in relations between the US and China, and that is what I think we've seen for the last 20 years in American administrations, both Republican and Democrat, then we should expect history as usual. So business as usual will likely lead to history as usual. And history as usual in this case would be a war that would be catastrophic and crazy, but not unlike World War I, which was catastrophic and crazy. But on the other hand, yes, as Santa Yanta taught us, only those who refuse to study history are condemned to repeat it. So we have no obligation to make the same mistakes that the Kaiser made or that Pericles even made. But we can learn from the historical record. So that's my treat size answers. Let me say a little bit more. So this first is on the rise of China. Uh, this bridge I can see out of my office. Kevin uh, remembers it well. It goes across the Charles River in Cambridge between the Kennedy School and the Business School. Uh, there were discussion of its renovation began when I was dean of the Kennedy School. I quit being dean in 1989. The project began in earnest in 2012. It was a two-year project. In 2014, they said it's not done. In 20, it'll take one more year. 2015, they said it's not finished. It'll take one more year. 2016, they said, we're not going to tell you when it's going to be finished. <laughs> okay. And it's three times over budget. Now, the Chinese uh, students here will probably be familiar with the Sanyan Bridge in Beijing, which I drove across oh, six weeks ago. It's got three times the number of traffic lanes as the Anderson Bridge. In 2015, the Chinese decided they need to renovate it. How long did it take to complete the project? Take a guess. How many? Two years. Two years. Other guesses? Six months. The answer is 43 hours. <laughs> you can go to YouTube. This is from YouTube. You can see this Sanyan Bridge being renovated. And you'll see the traffic flowing 43 hours later. So if, if the Chinese would actually come and finish the Harvard Bridge, I would, <laughs> I would make a small contribution since still the traffic is backed up. In the, in the first chapter, I, uh, this is taken from that, uh, I have a, a quiz that I give the students at Harvard. Uh, it's got 46 indicators, but I give the short version in the course. When could China become number one? And they, there are various indicators, and then you have to guess the year. So largest middle class, biggest manufacturer of smartphones, uh, fastest supercomputers, uh, lead in AI research, uh, number of billionaires, uh, so 46 of them. 
students at Harvard guess 2030 for one, 2040 for another one. Some say not in my lifetime. Then I show them chart two. Chart two says already. So all those things already happened. In fact, most Americans, most probably uh, British, don't know China is the single largest economy in the world today, measured by the yardstick that both the IMF and the CIA believe is the single best yardstick for comparing national economies, namely purchasing power parity. That was the big takeaway from the 2014 IMF World Bank meeting. But you won't read that in the newspapers. Okay, the second question, looking forward, uh, the impact of the rise of China. This is a chart I made for uh, a testimony I gave to the Senate Armed Services Committee in 2014. Uh, the former student of mine is the ranking uh, Democrat on the committee, Jack Reed. And after he had said to me, I had to make the thing simple, very simple for the members of the committee. So I would given him 10 pages, which I thought was brilliant. He said, Graham, that's not going to do it. I burned it into three pages. He said, that's still too complicated. I said, I'll make a cartoon. So this is what <laughs> I did. I, I gave him my 10 pages as well, but this is the cartoon. So I imagine the US and China as two kids on other ends of a seesaw on a playground. And the size of each of them is the size of their GDP. So in 2004, China is about 20% the size of US. In 2014, it's equal. And on the current trend lines in 2024, it's going to be 40% larger. And you go, whoa, who didn't, why, why didn't somebody tell me this? So what was being debated in the Obama administration, the big initiative towards Asia? What was it called? The pivot and the rebalance. It was sometimes called pivot or rebalance. What was that about? It said, we've been spending too much effort in the Middle East fighting wars, so we should take, take some of our weight off of our left foot so we can put more weight on our right foot in Asia, where the future is going to be. And as I point out, while we've been debating this, both feet have just sort of lifted off the ground. So the impact of the rise of China on the US and on the international order, I think you can see everywhere, every day. If you don't see China in your space and in your face, either you're not looking or just wait. Let's see if this, oh, okay. We're not getting uh, uh, audio, so we'll forget this. This is Secretary Cohen is introducing Jim Mattis, who's our Secretary of Defense, for his confirmation hearing. And he says, he's the only one here in the room besides me that knows what is Thucydides trap. And then they have a debate and discussion about this. Senator Weicker saying he's insulted everybody, that everybody knows what it's supposed to be. Okay, on to the third question. Can we use the concept of Thucydides' trap to help us understand the risks that we see uh, unfolding on the Korean Peninsula today. Risks that could drag China and the US into a war that neither wants. So this is at Mary Lago, and it was repeated again two weeks ago in Beijing. Trump uh, tells Xi Jinping, it is simply not going to be the case, it's not going to happen, that North Korea develops the capability to attack the American homeland with nuclear weapons. So you can solve this problem, he tells him. It's not even that hard. You can solve this problem. But if you don't solve this problem, I will solve this problem. And you're not going to like the way I do it. Actually, at that point, he served him chocolate cake for dessert, the opening dinner excused himself, went to the room next door, and announced that the U.S. had just launched uh, 59 cruise missiles against Syria to punish Assad, just to underline the point, how he could do this. So uh, I'd say, to, and I'll stop here, that basically we're going to watch this version of a Cuban missile crisis in slow motion, now accelerating, in which very shortly Trump uh, and she are going to come to a fork in the road. 
Either Kim Jong-un is going to conduct another couple of three tests of ICBMs, like the one he conducted yesterday, and the American intelligence community is going to say he now has a credible threat to attack San Francisco or Los Angeles with a nuclear weapon. That's either. Or Trump is going to attack North Korea to prevent that happening, which is what he's told Xi that he's going to do, and what he told him again in Beijing that he's going to do. Is Trump bluffing? Will Xi do something to constrain Kim Jong-un, like squeeze the oil pipeline? If he does, will this work? Or will we attack? And if we attack, how will that play out? So I would say we could watch this in real time, sadly. I mean, in the next, before this time next year, we will know that one of three things happened in the world. One, North Korea will have the capability to hit the U.S. West Coast with nuclear weapons. Or two, the U.S. will have attacked North Korea, maybe producing a war, maybe producing a war with China. Or three, there'll be a minor miracle. I've been praying for the minor miracle. Yeah. And I was even hopeful that that was unfolding in, as a result of the conversations between the private conversations between Xi and Trump, uh, in which they would say as adults to each other, we're not going to let this country drag the two of us into a war that we don't want. That would be insane. We should remember it did this already once before. That's what happened in 1950. Most of the Americans that were killed in 1950 and 52 and 51 and 52 and 53, and most of the Chinese who were killed were killed by each other in a war that was started by North Korea. So we're not going to let this happen, and we're going to work together to prevent it. That's what I'm still hopeful about, but I would say the tests yesterday made me a little more disappointed. So maybe that's enough to sort of get the, get the ball Very rolling. Good. Yes, that certainly has gotten the ball rolling. Um, and so to keep it rolling, I'd like to open up the floor to ask, to invite the audience to ask a few questions. And so I think we'll take about two or three questions from the audience and, and then turn it back to Professor Allison to respond. So do we have, I see one, two, three. Hello, hello. Uh, uh, please thanks. say your name and affiliation. Uh, yeah, uh, I am Sarthak Agrawal, and I'm a graduate student in economics at the university. Uh, thanks a lot for that insightful presentation, sir. Uh, my question is that are we trying to kind of oversell the achievements China can make in the next couple of decades? Because coming from an economic perspective, and most of the achievements you mentioned were primarily economic in nature, um, we know that the economic growth we have seen in China in the past couple of decades has kind of slowed a bit, and all trends suggest that it's not going to be at the same pace. And secondly, we also know from history that, that a constant leadership for a long time doesn't bode very well for the country's economic future, which is something we, we can probably expect in China about, about the leadership staying unchanged for another five or 10 years. So in light of these two developments, will it, will it still be fine to say that China will be the rising power it is right now? Thank you. Good. Um, so my name is Zhibo, a first year uh, DPhil student at the business school. So first, um, thanks, Mr. Allison, for sharing your uh, opinions. So for a while, uh, the Thucydides like, trap dominated all the conferences and debates from China to the United States. However, aside from historical evidence, if we think about the power of perception and also issue framing, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I perceive you as my, enemy, uh, as my enemy, I'll recalibrate my perceptions and actions against you, which influences your perception and actions. So sooner or later, we'll have an enemy. We created the enemy. But, but if from today we start to talk about like whether China will become uh, the U.S. 
next best ally or next best alliance, our best friend? Will it eventually change perceptions and actions to avoid unnecessary competition, which may not uh, exist in the first place? Um, wouldn't that be the topic of your next book, Destiny for Friendship or Destiny for Alliance? Thank you. Okay. Then we have a question. Uh, I wanted to address the... Uh, your name and... Oh, sorry. Paul Anirban Paul, uh, continuing ed student. I uh, wanted to address the challenges not just from a relative ranking between two powers, G2, but the absolute capability the nation states have to challenge or tackle problems like potentially by 2040 the mass movement of people uh, because of low-lying areas and environment, millions of people, uh, millions of people probably in Africa migration. Uh, and when you compare that to the threat and capability, it's quite possible that instead of the rise of a pure competitor, I want to hypothesize the opposite, the lack of pure partners, that no state individually, collectively, will have the capability, will, uh, in combination to address those mega challenges. And for, since there's nobody to call about stop the rising oceans, whereas there's somebody to at least call in Moscow or Beijing, wouldn't that be a worse possibility? Okay, so I think we'll, uh, I mean, e each one of these questions, if we did justice to, we would not have a chance for a conversation. So let me not do justice to them, but just do like the top of an uh, iceberg, and I'll take them in reverse order. So the gentleman, I think it's certainly right that if you, you know, let's imagine a, in the course I teach at Harvard, I have a character called the Martian strategist. So this is a lady that from Mars watches what goes on. And from time to time, we invite her to come to the class and give us some observations, what she thinks is going on. So she might well point out to uh, she and Trump, uh, you're living in a world of global challenges in which if the two of you were working together completely, hand in glove, you're probably going to be overwhelmed. So you need to get some more partners and all of you working on the same agenda. So I would say that, that would be a quite plausible bit of adult supervision if there were adult supervision. But of course, we know there's not. There's just states. And Trump is the president of the US. And she is the president of China. Modi is the president of India, so the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the character of these states and the character of their relations looks way more like what we've seen for the last hundred thousand, several thousand years than it does to some great new awakening. The climate peace looked promising if you took Paris as a first step towards a lot more and better. But now we see the U.S. has stepped back significantly from that, and the re nobody else has stepped up. So I would say that's a, that's a, a big, big question. On the destined for peace, or, or I like the question very much. So the, the, there are people who argue that if we are realistic about the fact that China is rising in a way that will, that seeks actually to displace the US as the predominant power in the neighborhood, that this will there, therefore force the recognition of them as a quote, enemy, and then that will feed the perceptions of both parties and can even accelerate an otherwise manageable situation. I think there's an argument to be made with that. I think, on the other hand, there's a greater risk, I believe, in being uh, uh, overly optimistic, maybe even uh, uh, casual, about the fact that from Xi Jinping's perspective, the idea that the US Navy is the arbiter of events in the South China Sea looks anomalous. I mean, as a Chinese PLA Navy guy who's a friend of mine says, he says, you're talking about the, the danger of a collision 
between American and Chinese ships in the South China Sea. There's no chance of a collision between American and Chinese ships in the Caribbean. Why? Because there's no Chinese ships there. There's a very good solution to this problem. If the US Navy is not in the South China Sea, that's Asians will solve this problem for themselves, and we'll solve it with them. That's his view, and I think that's a, a not unreasonable view. In fact, I have a good chapter in the book that Americans won't like, but the, and many Americans complain about, which is what if Xi's China was just like us? And the us being us when Teddy Roosevelt was leading the US into what he was supremely confident was gonna be an American century. And if you look at the way the U.S. behaved, Teddy Roosevelt thought, what in the world are foreign ships doing in the Caribbean? That's our lake. And what are foreigners doing in, in, in Cuba, where the Spanish were? And he looked for the first opportunity to kick them out of there, and he did, in a war. So I would say uh, China has been much more restrained under Xi so far. But if you watch, the, as I'm sure you did, the Party Congress two weeks ago, you see a China that's feeling more and more that our time has come, that we are now the rising power, that we deserve more place, more space, and that's very consistent with what I call in the book the, the rising power syndrome. That's very normal and very natural. So I did not find it surprising that she said, we are now going to stand tall and strong in the East. And we're going to be moving to center stage internationally because China is bigger and stronger and it's feeling more comfortable in that role. But from an American perspective, where the arrangements were made previously, those seem like changes in the status quo. Well, they are changes in the status quo and to the disadvantage of the U.S., at least if the U.S. tries to hang or cling to the status quo that's, that's existed before. Finally, on the question of the Chinese uh, economy, I tell the optimistic story, uh, but I can tell you the pessimistic story, too. I think uh, I, we have a China working group at Harvard that Larry Summers and I co-chair. Larry has been bearish about China every year for 10 years. So each year we make a bet. I've been bullish about China every year for 10 years. For 10 years, I've won them each year, the bet. Now, Herb Stein, who was a famous chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, had Stein's Law, which says, if a trend cannot continue forever, it won't. <laughs> so, and I proposed the Allison footnote to his uh, law, which says it's much easier to predict that something will happen then when? So the doctor can predict that you're going to die, but what you're interested in is how about when? You have any clues about when? So would I bet that China will manage to grow three times the rate of the U.S. for the next decade? It slowed down, but to, to more than three times the rate of the U.S. I think so. Uh, and then why? Well, you're making a bet about the agility and adaptability of the government. And then back to the question you raised. Well, but we all know that authoritarian governments can't work successfully. I mean, that's our theory of the case. But looking at the record recently, I would say, at least for American democracy, it doesn't seem to be working very well either. So it's the, it's the competition. On that note, I'd like to turn the floor over for a moment to ask Prime Minister Rudd for a few comments and take advantage of the fact that you're here as well. Well, just a few thoughts on the book. Um, I had the great honor of working with uh, Graham at the Harvard Kennedy School back in 2014. And so- uh, You're one of my tutors on the book, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's that the bad bits of the book. But, um, but why I think it's a useful book is because it makes very sharp and stark the alternatives which these countries uh, and their allies face for the future. And it can be chosen one way or another. Uh, those of us who have been engaged in the practice of politics, international politics, uh, firm believers that agency is alive and well. 
what leaders decide to do matters. It has consequences, some more immediate than we may think. And so uh, the second point is, if you look at the structure of international relations uh, in uh, East Asia and the West Pacific, it's a pretty brutally realist structure. Uh, you don't have the intermediation of a whole bunch of regional institutions targeted on the question of preserving the peace. There's no equivalent of the Council of Europe. There's no equivalent of the European Union. There's not even an OSCE. Uh, there never was a CSCE. It's a fairly raw environment governed by a whole bunch of unresolved territorial disputes. Korean Peninsula most spectacularly, Sankoki Diaoyudao, Taiwan, South China Sea, the list goes on. And then before you get round to the Sino-Indian border on the other side. And so it's a fairly raw environment. Uh, when people talk about the, the English school and, uh, the, and uh, international society, society there is a pretty rough and ready affair. Um, and then in the midst of that, you have in the post-World uh, War II environment, essentially uh, the unipolar power of the United States, subsequently to some extent in that theatre challenged by the Soviets, but not much. And then with the rise of China and its military capabilities, an emerging, shall I say, new polarity. So that's the nature, the kind of the brutal, bare-knuckled, uh, I would say hyper-realist nature of the environment out there. It's not for the faint-hearted. Um, wars happen, ships run into each other, uh, and it's a, a fairly brutal part of the world. So where the book is useful is forcing, I think, leadership elites in the US and China and those who are near and dear to both of them uh, to think through the consequences of what the agent, in this case the heads of these governments, actually do and carving out the future. Um, and that's why the Sunnylands process, which was begun in uh, Obama's second term when Xi Jinping was first elected, uh, the continuation of which is this uh, at Mar-a-Lago, is important because for the first time systemically, uh, these guys are actually discussing Thucydides' trap and discussing, frankly, uh, the respective national destinies of both countries as it relates to who governs the regional order and who governs the global order. Final point is this. If you look at China, as you know, I've been doing in my life since I first went to university, um, back in the Paleolithic period, the, um, the, uh, it is a dynamic. Jam, uh, uh, Graham's introductory chapter is right, but not just in terms of China's uh, internal dynamics vis-a-vis -vis the economy and economic capacity but both uh, more broadly on the question of China's stated intentionalities are changing as well. Those of us who study the texts carefully know that things are changing. Uh, from Deng Xiaoping until 2014, uh, China's axiom was uh, Guang Yang Hui Jue Bo Dang Tou. Hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Now the axiom is Fen Fa Yo Wei, your sword Zou Wei an active policy. China has some capacity. And then you look at the language of the 19th Party Congress, which the first time talks about a new order. Uh, and, you talk, and we're now talking about a new uh, set of international relations, a new set of rules for the international system, international structure, um, or, the, or the global order where the rules set by the victorious Western powers in 1945 will not necessarily hold and we will have a voice and we will articulate change and we will actually seek to bring about change. And so that is an objective description of the changes in Chinese declaratory policy. That's just real. And so the realist, therefore, challenge uh, is, uh, does America yield to this? And if so, by what mechanism? Secondly, what actual changes does China want, both operationally and in, as it were, the rules of the system? And thirdly, uh, when will that be articulated clearly and what will be the responsibility of the rest of the society of states? And that's right where we are at the moment. There's a lack of clarity about all of that, but uh, it is the value of the book lies in putting a stark set of possibilities out there. And... Uh, 
when I've debated John Mearsheimer on this, the father of uber-realism in the United States, public forums there, uh, where his proposition that war is inevitable between the United States and China, I ran the case for the defence that it was not inevitable, and in a large debate like this, we actually prevailed against uh, uh, Lord Mearsheimer. But, um, but, but let me tell you, uh, it is actually a matter for the intentionality, ideation and decision-making processes and preferred future orders of these two sets of leaders. And it's therefore in the balance which way we go. And the interesting, and this responds to in part to the question that was yeah. asked about the self-fulfilling prophecy or the self-negating prophecy. Would you like to respond? Well, I, I agree here completely with what Kevin said. I think first to recognize that Asia has a lot of unsettled matters, including territorial matters. So from a Chinese point of view, Taiwan is as much part of China as California is part of the US. But from Taiwanese point of view, many Taiwanese, and indeed many Hong Kongers, we don't want to be part of that country that's becoming more controlling and more uh, and more authoritarian. So you look at that and you say, well, how does that get settled? Well, that's a case in which the U.S. has been extremely accommodating. And I think China and the U.S. have worked artfully, but to the disadvantage of the Taiwanese. The British agreement with the, with the Chinese government about Hong Kong had a number of specific provisions. These provisions are being violated now. And as the Chinese government spokesman said, well, we agreed to those then, but this is now. But in Hong Kong, you see again that the islands, as Kevin mentioned. So there are a lot of issues that are potential issues. Korea, the topic we were talking about. So I was mentioning to, uh, to Kevin before, when I was out in China six or seven weeks ago, I'm talking to a a person who's reasonably high in their security system. And he said, you know, Graham, to tell the truth, there would be no problem in Korea e except for the fact that you're there. And I said, well, I had never thought of it that way. Tell me how this story works. He said, if you were not in, China, in Korea, the in US. South Korea, mm -hmm. uh, Korea would be a unified country. It would be a tributary of China. We wouldn't let it have nuclear weapons any more than we would let Vietnam have nuclear weapons or Myanmar. I mean, it wouldn't even, the question wouldn't even arise. So I said, well, that's an interesting perspective. Let me tell you my view. I, my view was we didn't volunteer to be in South Korea. We came there because your ally attacked South Korea and almost captured the place. We and the Australians beat the North Koreans back. Uh, the thing ended in an armistice. Uh, in the 60 years since then, our guy is one of the wonders of the world, South Korea. It's a vibrant society, a vibrant democracy, 13th largest economy, and your guy is an armpit. You know? uh, he said, well, so I said, we're not going anywhere. We're not walking away from, I mean, North, South Korea is a poster child of the Asian order that the US was trying to build. And he said, well, there's the problem. So I would say, to, thinking about the, the North Korean issue, in effect, is an overlay on this underlying dynamic in which one power is rising and thinking, this is my space. And the other power is ruling and saying, I've been providing the order in this space for a long time. It's been great for everybody. You should be grateful. You should even help support it. And that's a speech that I've given when working for the US government from time to time, but I think it would be as persuasive to many of my Chinese friends as uh, uh, the speech that the British gave to Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was also not persuaded. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to open the floor up again for questions. I see a few, yes, let's see. I'd like to take, I see one, there's a two, and three. Hi, my name is John. Uh, 
I'm an a MPP student here at the, the Blavatnik School. Thank you all for coming. Um, in, in your book, uh, you look at 16 cases, and only two of them are after the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, after the Second World War, and both of those cases end with the outcome of no war. Uh, so it's basically uh, Walt's old argument that nuclear weapons might be an instrument for peace. How do you see that? Hello, uh, my name is Mark Robinson. I'm from the Centre for International Studies in London, in SOAS. Um, fantastic talk, very interesting, great panel. Um, if we think about the Cold War, many people thought, you know, the USA and the Soviet bloc were destined for total mutual assured destruction. And the thing, of course, that prevented it was the possession of nuclear weapons. They fought many proxy wars, but they didn't actually go into... They got close, but they didn't actually take that step. I mean, Thucydides didn't have to struggle with nations that had nuclear weapons. Does your book touch on that topic and the fact that, you know, that in many people's eyes is something that actually prevents that final step into total war? Uh, questions over here as well. Um. Hello. Uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm a master's student here at Oxford studying uh, development economics uh, and a fellow Marshall Scholar as well. Um, my question is actually very similar to the other two, so I'll just build off of it. So we've established, you know, of course, we're uh, in an age of nuclear weapons. In addition to that, I'm wondering if the current conditions that we're in, uh, if, you view, if you view them as fundamentally different than what has come before in a way that could potentially change the analysis. So not only do we have nuclear weapons, we have a high level of economic interdependence between the U.S. and China. We have, uh, you know, avenues for communication through the Internet and the like, uh, unlike we've seen before. Lots of peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication as well with the number of students studying abroad, and, you know, in the U.S., et cetera. So do you view that the, the fact that the conditions are so different in the 21st century and the, the um, advent of all these technologies, does that change the decision-making calculus between the two countries in a way um, that we haven't seen with, uh, with the other cases? I think we'll take one or two more questions. I saw one and two. You had a question? No. One question there, and then one question. I'll take one more here, and then one more here, and then that will be the then I'll... Hi, my name is Jasmine. I'm a Schwarzman scholar, and I'm a politics math master student here. My question is, you mentioned North Korea as kind of the wild card that could trigger a conflict between China and the United States. Um, but kind of in reference to your book, Essence of Decision, do you identify any domestic actors in China or in the United States, be it bureaucracies or you know, collections of individuals that you think could play the same role of setting off a conflict or of, being, of pushing in that direction? Okay, we had one question back here and then one question here and then... Hi, my name's Mike. I'm an MPP student uh, here at Palatnik. Uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, my question was, you mentioned there were four examples where folks didn't fall into the trap. And I was curious if there were uh, decisions that were made that very clearly set them apart that prevented uh, that happening. And I'd be very curious to hear if there were, uh, Mr. Rudd, if you've seen these decisions play out uh, up close and personal, if those lessons are being considered. And so the last question. Um, thank you for this chance of the last question. I'm an MPP student from Brevard School of Government. And my question is, uh, for the two countries to avoid dropping into the trap, we need to look ahead. And for the North Korea issue, it somehow resulted from the Cold, um, the, the, the Cold War time. And I, the story is too long, and there are also some misunderstandings on the well, uh, China's involvement in that and some some accidental ones. But uh, my, uh, my question is, uh, if we look ahead, if you look at, at what the most recent visit from President, of Donald, uh, President Donald Trump to China in November, and look at the achievement that they have, they have done uh, through this trip, and look at uh, um, the dynamics of the, uh, the, the ideas among these two leaders, and the China's uh, uh, proposal to build up the new type of the relationship among big powers. Do you get some clues for your future or uh, uh, a study or a uh, written of this, to continue this story? Okay, very good. Thank well, you very much. Okay, so fantastic questions and each deserves a, 
a long uh, discussion. Let me, I'll just try to hit the top of, of several of them. And I'll, I'll take them in the order that they, were, that they were done. The first two were about nuclear weapons and no war. And I think that what can be said is for one, for sure, nuclear weapons are different. So I, I do, all these people want to say things are different. Nuclear weapons are different. Uh, so I would say big different. And particularly when nuclear arsenals reach the level of mutual assured destruction, so that if I attack you, you can still kill me. So the decision to attack you is suicidal. So that leads to caution. And we saw that in the Cold War. That was a factor, a significant factor in the Cold War. And that's a significant factor in the US-Chinese relationship. So in that sense, that's a good thing to, to, to have the opportunity to build on. Now, there's another lecture I would give you, which is do not feel too comfortable with nuclear weapons. The reason why mutual assured destruction is mad is that it is madness. It's Provide, it's providing for your security uh, with a device which, if it were to be triggered by accident, will destroy you completely. So I have a discussion of that in the book, and it's a, basically a version of a doomsday machine. So yes, it makes me extremely cautious, but no, I should not take a great comfort from that because it involves other risks. When the 21st century being different, and I think that's a theme that came through several of the questions, in the book, I try to ask, in the conclusion, the book is mainly about diagnosis. And I argue, especially for public policy students, uh, diagnosis should precede prescription. This is a very anti-American idea. <laughs> uh, Amer Americans don't just stand there, do something. Okay. I say, no, stand there. Make sure you understand the patient's problem before you roll her in for surgery or whatever. Okay? So the diagnosis is what this book is about. And the argument is about the diagnosis, which I think is roughly correct. I, in the final chapter of the book, though, I say, well, therefore what? People will say, well, gee, you have to tell me the solution. And I say, again, Washingtonians will not like this book because in Washington, the, the template requires you to describe the solution to a problem in the same sentence that you identified the problem. And I say that's a problem for, okay, that's a, that's a, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know the solution to this problem. I think what the book is arguing is we need to recognize the extreme danger of the objective conditions that we're facing and then notice that in the cases in which this was successfully traversed earlier, that produced extreme imagination and even extreme adaptability. So that's not the answer to the problem, but it just suggests that if you're going into a dangerous situation, you should make sure to recognize it. Don't be complacent, but don't be terrified, but then recognize business as usual, not the right answer. Okay? So if you were doing that, and I then say a little bit, you would start, U.S. and China, let's imagine again my Martian who comes down and she's talking to Xi and Trump and she says, guys, here, one, you have a vital common interest in avoiding a nuclear war of which you'd be the first victims. So that's bedrock. Secondly, you've got economies that are so intertwined and so entangled that if you were to have a war, Walmarts are going to be empty in the U.S., and Chinese factories are going to be producing stuff for oats. Okay? And where will the U.S. get a loan for the deficit? Okay? This doesn't make any sense. Okay? So there's a version of like MAD, I have something called MAID, Mutual Assured Economic Destruction. This could be disastrous. And thirdly, climate, as we talked about before. I mean, it's for sure that if the two biggest emitters in the world don't find a way to deal with this problem jointly, then 50 or 100 years from now, we're going to leave the grandchildren uh, an environment nobody can live in. So it's the same, the same biosphere for, for everybody. So there's plenty of grounds for things to build on if you were trying to start with that. And if you had the common interest, the shared interest, of, of more prominently being pursued, and this is actually Kevin's big idea in a piece that he wrote earlier about constructive 
uh, realism, I think. Uh, that basically, if you were constructively, realistically dealing with these problems, you'd have a context in which then the other problems would look smaller, because they are small problems. It's just that there's small problems can often drag you somewhere where, where you don't want to go. On the North Korean decision making, that's a great, uh, a great question. So I think the American security establishment would be, uh, and is even hoping, that between my, among my three options for North Korea, that we'll know this time next year, one, they've succeeded to develop a capability to attack the US, two, the US attacked them, or three, this minor miracle. They're thinking the first will be good enough. As they won't be all that different from the Soviet Union or from China. We deterred them. We tried to defend against them. That worked out. At least we didn't have a war yet. Okay, so that's better than a war now. That's the kind of the, the inclination that we're. But that I think may not be the view of Donald Trump, and he happened to be the president. So I think we're going to watch this, the, the dynamics of the American decision making, in the Korean case. The North Korean one, again, that's a pretty black box. But there's no question that if you were just betting that Kim Jong-un is another Kim and who believe, behaves just like his father, we would not have seen this test yesterday. So that was a surprise. This guy is a very genuinely ruthless character. He's killed his uncle. He's killed his half-brother. Uh, he kills uh, generals in the, in the PLA, or sorry, in the... Uh, in the North Korean military who look like they're friendly to the Chinese. So I would say that, that the, the, the dynamic of these two leaders is a big, is a big question. And then finally, let's see here. Uh, the no war cases go from the first case, which is the rise of uh, Spain at the end of the 15th century, the beginning of the 16th century, to rival and then overtake Portugal, which is the dominant sea power at the time. And there we get the great intervention of the Pope. So the Pope basically says, no war. Here's a line I'm drawing down the middle of the map. You can have this side, you do that side. So that's why people in Brazil speak Portuguese. They got that side. Okay? Uh, well, we don't have a Pope or any such authority today you know, that could tell Trump and Xi Jinping, that's it. Here, I drew this line. Uh, violate this and you're going to be excommunicated. So it would be nice actually to have a, 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 a authority. The rise of the US at the beginning of the 20th century at the same time as Germany virtually to rival first and then to surpass Britain is a very interesting and instructive case. And there the British were brilliant in adapting and adopting to the realities that they faced. Partly they had two rising powers. Germany closer to home and the US at a distance. But they also looked and saw, wait a minute, these Americans, if they want to, can seize Canada. And Canada was a colony that was a crucial part of the empire. So they thought the empire was vital for Britain, that other things that were simply vested could be adapted and adjusted, which they did. So I would say there's a big lesson for us there. And then the Cold War is a great one where basically the surge of imagination that created the Cold War strategy is actually what one would wish for in the current situation. And there was a question. Oh, I'm sorry. There's, uh, there's I'm sure there's many more, many more questions. But you wanted to respond to? Your question was about decisions, sir. Is that right? Uh, and the pre preface to the question was? I think regrettably in the case so far of the negotiations on North Korea, let me take that as a classic and immediate case study, no. Um, and, uh, and I follow this really closely. Um, this uh, uh, is uh, A, um, as Graham said before, scenario one, which is I think probably the Chinese de facto position, which is that after all the song and dance has occurred, that the rest of us will just get used to North Korea as a bona fide nuclear weapon state. Now, actually, I don't see that working in the, uh, not just in the Trump mind, I don't see it working in the mind of the US, frankly, national security establishment. 
much more broadly. Uh, the second is uh, the China diplomatic magic scenario, uh, which is uh, the Chinese object to all the pressure being put on them, but that's the reality of what's happening. Um, and uh, we have the events of yesterday. If I was Sung Tao, for example, the uh, minister in charge of the International Department of the Chinese Communist Party sent to Beijing 10 days ago uh, as Xi Jinping's emissary to sort out the future, I'd be feeling concerned about the response from our North Korean friends uh, because uh, basically they've said, uh, no way, Jose, uh, or at least the North Korean equivalent of that expression. Um, um, and then the third scenario, uh, which is uh, that uh, the United States does undertake unilateral military action. Um, and my sort of melancholy duty, I think, uh, is to say to people, this is not uh, as off the radar as a possibility as many people in the international community think. Um, historically, having looked at this thing for 20 or 30 years and in government, out of government, and looking at all the intelligence analyses, maybe a 5% possibility historically. Now, the figure I much prefer is about 25 to 30% possibility. What are the manifestations of it? Demonstration attack on some vacant North Korean territory to say with the Moab, hey, we can do this. Um, secondly, an attack across the nuclear facilities but not against the core arteries of the North Korean state. And thirdly, something more ambitious than that. And the open question is the North Korean response if it uh, goes against uh, the South Korean capital Seoul with an artillery barrage from across the 38th parallel, that invites regime suicide as well and on the part of the North because then you would be unleashing what uh, President Trump described as fire, fury and Dante's inferno uh, on speed. That is, wasn't exactly what he said. Uh, so I can just conclude by saying this, that uh, there is a, a Chinese friend said this to me recently in Beijing. It was a very wise observation, it was, because he agreed on the scenarios. And he said, yeah, the real challenge of effective uh, diplomacy right now, with or without a third party, is this, to avoid actually getting into the crisis or pre-crisis zone for the simple reason, essence of decision, a crisis generates its own logic. Then he went on to say to me, and the problem is, war has its own logic as well. So this is not inevitable, but the virtue of Thucydides trap is that it points, I think, to the stark possibilities. Uh, and because uh, if you did have an outbreak of a general war on the Korean Peninsula, people have not actually extrapolated from that as to what China would then do. People were stunned when Mao in 1950, three months after securing victory in October of 49, uh, then marches uh, into North Korea. Uh, when everyone thought it was in the natural Chinese interest to consolidate their own revolution, forget all of that. So therefore, how would Xi Jinping and the Chinese state be viewed internally uh, if there was a general conflagration on the, on the Korean Peninsula, which is not a huge possibility, but as I said, 25%, um, and could it trigger something wider? Again, what I was told by my Chinese interlocutors was that Xi Jinping would be seen as extraordinarily ineffective domestically were he not to respond under such a scenario. So what's the moral lesson of all this? Stay clear of the crisis zone. Thank Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank both, both of our speakers for some wonderful food for thought. And I want to also state that we'll be complementing that with drinks subsequently in the Inamori Forum afterwards, as well as the opportunity to purchase Destined for War if you do not already have your coffee. So again, if I could, thank, if I could ask you one more time to thank our speakers for some wonderful...